sometimes democratic party leaders in the US or you know similar political leaders in Europe saying you know there's no way we can bring them back you know we've done everything we could uh, they just don't understand you know final point look if you say that you know how can you then convince uh, other people or other parts of the world that you believe in electoral democracy hello this is rob johnson president of the institute for new economic thinking we have the good fortune today to be in conversation with a person who i think my young scholars should study closely not just your work but your courage your breadth of curiosity and the way in which you how would i say rigorously analyze real problems and uh, i'm talking about thomas piketty who uh, is a professor of economics at the paris school of economics and author of many many articles in all the top journals uh, he's written a number of books most powerfully at least in my experience uh, was capital in the 21st century, capital in ideology. I've skimmed through A Time for Socialism in his new book on the, how would I say, brief history of equality. What I am stunned by in preparing for this conversation is in these difficult times, how positive, constructive, and courageous this gentleman has been and i see this book as an example like i said for our young people to follow but i also see a long history of work when i was a graduate student i knew dr anthony atkinson worked with him at, and the whole uh, group including uh facundo alvarado gabriel zuckman emmanuel science and dr peckety as they built the world top income database and basically created the platform for rigorous analysis of the questions of inequality. That's a tremendous gift and it's a gift that keeps on giving as you're gonna find out in the next hour. Thomas, thanks for joining me. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks, thanks for inviting me. So let's talk with that body of work with the prominence of you and that whole constellation of people that you work with what inspired you to create this particular message well you know it was important for me you know to try to write a short book on the history of, of, uh, of equality that's one thing you know my previous books i mean i don't regret uh, anything but you know of course they are quite long you know in particular capital and ideology was, uh, you know, 50% longer than Capital in the 21st century, which was already very long. And so after, after, you know, after writing Capital and Ideology, I thought, okay, I have to stop somewhere. You know, I cannot continue writing longer and longer books. Uh, and uh, so, you know, that's objective number one was to write something more concise. And objective number two, and I guess the main novelty of the book, it's not only that it's shorter, it's that, you know, by, by being shorter, it, I, I, I sort of clarified, I think, the general message and the sort of the main lessons that I have learned from all this work. And, and I guess the main message that I'm trying to push in this new book called A Brief History of Equality, uh, as, as opposed to inequality, is that, you know, I try to develop a sort of optimistic perspective. I try to show, well, look, you know, this can seem paradoxical because there are lots of terrible things in the world today. Uh, and, and, you know, in some dimensions, inequality has worsened in recent decades. But if we take a very long run perspective, uh, in fact, you know, there's been a long run movement toward more equality, uh, both more political equality, social equality, and also economic equality to a large extent. This is a movement that has never been uh, easy, that has never been natural in any meaningful sense. You know, it has been grounded in political mobilization, uh, social struggles, uh, and most importantly, you know, the, the constructive transformation of institutions, you know, the development of new uh, legal system, uh, uh, fiscal system, uh, educational system, electoral rules. This is a movement that has not been there forever. You know, it's grounded in history. It's, a, it's not a long run trend that has been going on since the Neolithic times. You know, it started 
basically, you know, at the end of the 18th century with the, the French Revolution, the US Revolution to some extent, uh, uh, and, and it starts in particular with the abolition of the uh, tax privileges of the aristocracy in the French context. It also starts with the first slave revolt in Saint-Domingue in 1791, which sort of sets the beginning of the end of slave and colonial societies. And, and then, you know, in the following two centuries, it has been continuing, you know, in the 19th century with the, the uh, final abolition of slavery, the, the development of the labor movement, the rise of male suffrage, universal male suffrage, and in the 20th century with the rise of universal uh, female suffrage, uh, uh, decolonization war, uh, civil rights movement in the US, uh, the rise of social security, the rise of progressive taxation. And this is a movement that's continuing today, you know, of course, with the Black Lives Matter movement, the Me Too movement, and, and uh, you know, this long-run quest for more social, political, economic equality, equality of status, is still going on because we still, you know, we still live in societies where there is enormous uh, uh, power of money, for instance, in politics. So, you know, we are not back in the 18th century with the privileges of the aristocracy, but, you know, there are all sorts of new privileges around and, you know, our democracy is still very, very imperfect and incomplete. And, you know, maybe one day in 50 years, 100 years, when we look at today's period where, you know, you can... Uh, put uh, whatever private money you want with no limit in the uh, financing of political campaign, in the influence of the media. You know, we have such an, a system of unequal political participation, unequal voice that, you know, maybe one day we we'll look at this at something sort of intermediate between, uh, you know, 19th century or 18th century democracy and, and, and more effective democracy. And it is the same for other dimensions of inequality. You know, we... Uh, you know, okay, we've seen the end of slavery, decolonization, civil rights, but we still have enormous uh, racial discrimination, uh, uh, racial injustices within each country and at the international level. So the, the general, uh, you know, viewpoint in the in the book is, uh, okay, you know, there's been a long run movement toward more equality. This has been very successful in the long run. This has come with more economic prosperity, you know, in particular the rise toward more equal access to education has been absolutely central, both for the rise of more equality and more prosperity. We can and we, we should continue in this direction in the 21st century. This will take, again, you know, big political mobilization, big political battles, but we should not lose sight of the fact that, you know, history is not deterministic, it's not frozen. So, you know, the, the enormous transformation in the, in the political systems, the economic systems, the fiscal systems that have already happened over the past two centuries, you know, it's something, you know, you, if you had told someone in 1900 or 1910 that there would be uh, enormous uh, progressive taxation, rise of social security in the following century, you know, many people would have not believed it. So I think when we look at the future, we have to take this long run uh, perspective. So, you know, in my book, I, when I make proposal about what I call a, a you know, new form of democratic socialism and participatory socialism, multicultural socialism, you know, I'm, I'm not saying this is going to happen next week uh, right away, you know, but I, at the end of the day, you know, I think what the kind of perspective that I am proposing, the, the kind of international economic system that I am proposing, you know, is not more different from the system we have today then the system we have today is different from the system we had one century ago. So it's, it's, I think it's important to reopen the discussion about the, the kind of long run future we want, which doesn't mean we will get there next week. But if we don't even know where we want to go in 50 years or 100 years, you know, we are, we are certainly not going to get anywhere. And, you know, on the other side of the political spectrum, you have all this, uh, you know, a xenophobic, racist, sort of identitarian uh, retreat movement, which, you know, don't hesitate to push forward, you know, a sort of very strong view, you know, and I think very reactionary view of the future. And it's very important, you know, that the progressive camp, so to speak, or at least, you know, uh, uh, you know, people who are ready to, to stand for equality, equality, uh, you know, of all forms, uh, uh, you know, between social classes, between genders, between races, uh, are 
you know, ready to take again this task of saying, look, this has worked in the past. We've made lots of progress. We can, we should continue. And looking at the historical uh, record, uh, you know, I, I enormous success, for instance, of very progressive taxation of income in the 20th century in the United States. You know, we have to revisit this record and, and, and you know, in order to push uh, uh, an ambitious uh, agenda for the for the for the future so that's you know what i'm trying to contribute to in this optimistic okay. book which i should let me just conclude you know th uh, this is a book of my own you know of course I'm, I'm the only one responsible for you know whatever views are being expressed but you know by, by the kind of uh, uh, collective work and in particular enormous project of historical and comparative data collection on which i rely and which i and you know, I'm trying to give a short synthesis of this work in this new book. All the, the this research work could never have been conducted without this incredible international research network. So there are all the great people you have mentioned, uh, Tony Atkinson, Emmanuel Saez, Gabriel Zuckman, Facundo Alvarado, Lucas Chancel. But it's much bigger than this. It's over 100 researchers from all over the world. Lots of institutions also have helped us. And, you know, I met us in our early development uh, a number of years ago and, uh, you know, United Nations Development Program, uh, uh, European Research Council, you know, lots of uh, public and non-profit uh, uh, institutions have helped us develop this little, uh, you know, global public good where we're trying to, to provide more transparency on income and wealth inequality, because in the end, we really believe that this is a sort of democratic mobilization, democratic awareness, uh, uh, and, you know, the fact that more citizens can appropriate for themselves, you know, this kind of evidence. You know, economic data is too important to be left to economists and to experts. We want citizens <laughs> to be able to appropriate this for themselves. And so, Yes. You know, we are trying to contribute to this with this little uh, global public good, which is a world inequality database, and, and this could never have been possible without so much support from so many people. And uh, yes, so, you know, this little book that I write is just one little output out of this much broader collective uh, uh, research uh, agenda. Well, I, I, would well say, I would say from, from my experience, my experience Many people treat the economy like it's some mechanical thing that doesn't require software, to use an analogy. And the software of governance, of innovation, of thinking about how to handle externalities and public goods, those are little building blocks in the back pages of our textbook. But you're bringing all this to light, and you are also bringing to light in, in the more recent books and interviews that let's say there's a bit of difference between scientific analysis for the public good and marketing for self-interest. And a lot of the information and a lot of the debate, I see you providing what I'll call the North Star of the public good to navigate toward. If no one does that, we don't know where we're going. We're swamped in the marketing for self-interest and despondency rises and what I might call in the despondency and resignation, the temptation towards authoritarian alternatives becomes stronger. So I see I see what you're doing is very purposeful and it's very deep and it's very credible. But I do, I'm, I'm quite interested in what you might call the institutions that you think at this time, perhaps with climate on the horizon, having just experienced the pandemic, the, I just made a podcast and talked with the people, Max Lawson, uh, at Oxfam. They said the top 10 wealthiest people on earth doubled their net worth versus the pandemic and didn't pay any tax when a reasonable slice tax, not of their wealth, but of the increment in their wealth, could have largely paid for vaccination of everyone on the planet and saved trillions of dollars in fiscal stimulus that people used in coping. So I see all of these dilemmas, many people who are not economists, not trained formally like you or I, or, or many of our uh, audience today, they smell a rat right now, but they just don't know how to find the exterminator 
and get back to feeling like they're on a healthy backyard. How, uh, how do we organize the process? How do we create the nautical society that's directed towards your North Star, especially in the realm of globalization where the nation state is not any longer so, like the treaty of westphalia model doesn't work in the era of nanosecond mobility of capital people hiding their money offshore and all kinds of other things so we have to have a, almost like a global governance solution and that's even before we talk about climate yeah no these are big challenges you know i think the, the you know, the democratization of, of economic knowledge, you know, is, is really, to me, a, a big part of the solution. And, you know, there is so much more progress to be made in this direction. You know, I've, I've tried to contribute a little bit to that, but let's be honest, you know, the kind of very long books I have written, even though it sold a lot, you know, millions of copies, you know, I'm, I'm not sure this is really something, uh, you know, uh, everybody's going to read until the end. So, you know, writing shorter books can contribute, but it goes much beyond this. You know, I think, for instance, you know, in the World Inequality Database today, it's still, you know, it's easier to use it when you're uh, when you're a researcher, a scholar. You know, there, there are lots of other ways to communicate knowledge. You know, through videos, through uh, through training sessions, through uh, um, you know other means of communication, which you know modern communication technology, you know, would allow us to do so much more and, and to be honest you know we've done so little for now i mean partly because we were focused on the research partly for a lack of resources partly you know because this takes time and but you know we're not going to stop there you know we, we that's a, a, a long-term commitment i i really believe that you know a big part of our you know uh, democratic problems today and you know sometimes some of the disappointment with with democracy uh, has to do with the fact that uh, uh, you know economic knowledge and economic issues, you know, have, have sort of been left to uh, sometimes a very small group of experts with very conservative uh, views, and uh, and you know we, you know, getting back the citizens and you know also other uh, uh, social scientists from sociology, from history, from political, you know, to to go back to economic issues and not leave these issues to to uh, to small uh, small. Uh, uh, self-proclaimed uh, experts, you know, I think is, uh, is is very, very important. Now, there's also, you know, you mentioned the sort of the nation state and the national limitation of our public conversation. I, I have been involved in, a, you know, another project in recent year, which is called the Manifesto for the Democratization of Europe, which Mm -hmm. You know, we, we try to develop a sort of grass. We got like 200 or uh, yeah, between 150 and 200,000 uh, signatures in Europe, you know, which is not huge, but it's, you know, it's the equivalent of the population of Luxembourg, after all, which have a veto power uh, on every tax decision in Europe. You know, this is less than, uh, this is, you know, this is less than 1%. This is less than 0.1% of the population of Europe. So, you know, in, in, uh, in France, under Ancien Regime, the nobility was about 0.5 to 1% of the population, and they had obviously veto power on the tax legislation until, you know, the revolution took it away from them. So today, you know, we live in a very different world, but we still have some sort of deep institutional problems. So in the case of the European Union, you know, the fact that 0.1% of the population can have veto power on any possibility to have a tax policy for the other uh, you know, 99.9 percent. You know, is you know is a is a problem. So you know, we have set up a, an institutional system which has lots of good ingredients into it. You know, I am a federalist European, and I am a federalist citizen of the world. So you know, I believe you know we need more European Union. We need more agreements between the African Union, the European Union. We need the Arab leagues to develop again new, uh, more uh, ambitious federalist approach uh, uh, to solve the problem of the, of the Middle East. So, you know, I, I am a deep core uh, federalist and internationalist, but we need to put, uh, you know, international cooperation, you know, to the service of Social justice, fiscal justice. You know, if you so in the in the manifesto for the democratization of Europe, what we say basically is, okay, you know, a group of country, you know, say you know the core uh, uh, eurozone countries should be able and should decide on their own 
you know, to create a common uh, uh, democratic assembly so that they can have uh, uh, you know, common budget uh, in terms of uh, green uh, uh, investment, in terms of uh, uh, progressive uh, tax on high wealth, high income uh, uh, citizen. And, you know, if, if other countries in the European Union want to join, that's perfectly fine. But, you know, if they don't want to join, they should not make it impossible for countries that want to move to, to, you know, to a more, uh, uh, more equitable uh, kind of, uh, of political and economic system to, to do so. Because if we continue uh, you know, with, with free trade, free capital flows, without any tax coordination, without any uh, coordination about carbon mm -hmm. emission and, and you know, social uh, 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 objective and inequality objective, uh, you know, then we should not be surprised that that uh, uh, we have uh, you know very big part of the lower income groups and you know lower mid middle income groups who feel very negatively about globalization and about European integration uh, in the context of Europe. And you know, this is what has led to uh, to to Brexit. This is what has led to some extent to Trumpism. And and I'm really trying hard, you know, in my you know, in, in my own country, you know, to, where, you know, there's a tendency today in the European Union to say, okay, you know, Brexit, you know, this, this crazy uh, British nationalist, there's nothing we could do to keep them with us, you know, they were just crazy. But in fact, you know, when you look at who voted, uh, you know, for Brexit, you know, you have the same profile that what we had in France when we had a, a referendum in 2005 uh, 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 about Europe, you know, which is at the... Uh, Upper income groups, upper education groups are very happy with you know European integration, globalization. Lower income groups, middle, lower middle income groups are, are very negative. And you cannot just say, okay, you know they are nationalists, they are stupid, they don't understand. We will explain better. You know, I think this has to do with uh, uh, sort of structural problems in the way we have organized globalization and and the fact that it benefits in a disproportionate manner the most mobile. Uh, economic actors, and in particular, you know, we've created a very sophisticated legal system on, of free capital flows without any control and without any uh, way to, to make uh, uh, the different uh, uh, social groups uh, contribute, uh, you know, in, in relation to how much wealth and income they have accumulated. So, you know, you create a system where basically you can uh, benefit from the public infrastructure of a country, from the public education system in a country in order to, to accumulate wealth. And then, you know, you can press on a button and transfer your assets in another jurisdiction and nothing has been planned, you know, to follow you and to make you mm -hmm. contribute in proportion to, you know, how much you have benefited from the public uh, infrastructure and how much you have been able to accumulate. And then you explain the immobile classes, you know, the rest of the population, the, uh, you tell them, oh, you know, that's too bad. We don't know where the high wealth uh, individuals have gone. And we're going to have to tax you, you know, the immobile people, because at least you're still there. But, you know, at some point, you know, this is a machinery to make the, the, the middle class and the lower middle class, you know, very skeptical about this entire organization, which has nothing... Uh, natural, you know, it is man-made, it is a specific institutional setup, mm -hmm. and, you know, the institution could be designed differently. International uh, uh, talks at uh, the level of the OECD, the G20, you know, have started to, you know, since the 2008 financial crisis to um, uh, talk about this and move in this direction. You know, we've had this agreement last year about a minimum tax rate on multinational corporation. But this is still far too uh, limited, and in particular, uh, you know, for on that example, you know, the 15 percent minimum tax rate was uh, far too small. You know, small and medium-sized companies and middle-class taxpayers pay very often a lot more than 15 percent. You know, if you include uh, income tax, social contribution, everything. So, you know, if a multinational creating a subsidiary in a tax haven can be can pay only 15 percent, that that won't work. Uh, uh, and and, uh, and in addition, probably the even bigger problem with the agreement last year uh, was that uh, the countries in the south, you know, didn't get anything. So it was basically a scheme where you know rich countries in the north would split between them 
you know, some of the tax base that is uh, currently located in tax havens in the in the north, and the south will get almost zero share of the of the new tax base, which to me is the biggest problem. And and you know, this is what makes this kind of deal completely um, and unsustainable. You know, especially given the huge. Uh, 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 you know, damages that countries in the South are going to uh, suffer because of global warming, because of all the negative externalities produced by the North. But even without that, I mean, this makes things even worse, but even without that, you know, I think it's important to realize that there will be no uh, rich country or rich uh, firms or rich individuals today without, you know, the global economy, without poor countries. You know, the entire process of wealth accumulation, you know, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, uh, uh, you know, did not happen in autarky. You know, it happens through a global economic system based on global uh, division of labor and global exploitation of natural resources and also mm -hmm. of human resources, sometimes in a very brutal manner. Uh, uh, and without this system, you know, we, we there will be no rich country today. And so I think, you know, today, uh, 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 you know, of course, nobody individually is responsible for all this long, uh, you know, colonial legacy, etc. But we are all responsible individually for uh, 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 accepting to, 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 you know, deciding or not to take this into account in our analysis of, you know, the world today. And, and to take a concrete example, you know, I think when we talk about international tax reform, you know, there should be, you know, every country in the world should receive at least, you know, positive fraction of the total tax revenue coming from the largest, uh, the most powerful economic actors in the world, multinationals and high wealth individuals. And every country in the world should receive a fraction of this on the basis of their population. Uh, and, you know, even if it's a small fraction of the this total tax revenue, you know, for very poor countries, it will make a major difference, you know, to be able to count on this resource, you know, as opposed to a system where they have to beg year after year. And, and you know, the basic justification for doing that is simply that there should be a minimum equal uh, right to development, to investment in education, healthcare, uh, from every citizen in the world. You know, when we were talking about the vaccine during the pandemic, we could see or we should have seen that, you know, there's, everybody should have should have access to this sort of minimal uh, um, um, health expenditure, but, you know, it's more general uh, more general than, than, than this. And if you add to this all the damages that are, that are related to global warming, of course, this makes the case even more, uh, you know, even more compelling. But, but even without that, it will still be, it will still be, uh, you know, uh, I think very important to move the discussion in this direction. In an earlier, earlier uh, essay, essay, that, essay, or excuse me, an interview me. you did with uh, Daniel Steinmetz Jenkins, I believe it was at The Nation, uh, you talked about uh, kind of the dynamics, I'll call it among elites, that there's a Brahmin elite that is very intellectual, and then what they might call the merchant class. And I've often thought, Let's say, you know, I was an undergraduate at MIT, went into electrical engineering. If I had stayed in the merchant class building in this digital age, and I thought today, either I or my son or daughter had a great idea, I'd be afraid it couldn't be realized because of the breakdown of all of our systems. In other words, what I'm saying is the Brahmin elite should be saying to these guys, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. You guys have great commercial ideas, but unless we do things like adjustment assistance, when we talk about globalization, we can make everybody better off and nobody worse off. I grew up in Detroit. Walk around Detroit or Cleveland and see if anybody believes that possibility. Without transformational assistance, there's going to be a lot of resistance to energy transformation related to the dangers of climate and global warming. So what I, what I guess I'm saying is, I think you might be the best friend of a long-term equity portfolio. And your own books have taught me that the time when the distribution of wealth gets flattened, meaning less extreme, 
is the time of world wars and crises. So if you can, like I say, do the ounce of prevention, you don't have to pay the pound of cure from the social collapse and your good ideas can blossom. Oh, sorry, Rob. I think I missed I missed a sentence. You're, you're, you said I would be the best friend of... Of the merchant class, aspiring merchant class, because by creating with your vision of these government structures, something that what you might call um, is making so social sustainability more likely, you're allowing a blossoming and a vitality and an appreciation of innovation that will make them profitable. You're not necessarily enemies. In the long run, you're right. Yes. In, in no, I don't, I'm not talking about on Wednesday night at the bar. That's different. <laughs> but but yeah, you have uh, a prescient vision, and they probably don't fear the collective social instability as much as I sense they should. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, you know, it's always a problem. Uh, you know, when you look back uh, in time, you always feel that, uh, you know, the elite, uh, in some cases, you know, should have accepted the the structural change before but you know i was mm -hmm. talking of the french revolution you know of course ex post you feel you know how did these people you know in the nobility how could they could they imagine that they could get away with the system of you know uh, tax privileges for basically one percent of the population mm -hmm. forever you know it, it looks but yeah you know they were accustomed to an organization of the world where you know, if I'm trying to give them a chance and not just being selfish and, you know, and mm -hmm. they were selfish, mm -hmm. of course, but if, if I'm trying to give them a chance about what kind of view of the world justified their uh, of views, you know, conservatism and then, you know, their view of the world, uh, uh, just like many elite today, is to say, okay, that's all fine. You know, your story about uh, social justice, tax justice is perfectly fine. But the only problem is, you know, if we start moving in this direction, we will never know where to stop. So, you know, it will be chaos, basically. So we have to organize society through, you know, strong principles. And, and the, the division, uh, sort of different function in society between the nobility class, the clergy class, the, the, the working class, you know, was the organizing principle. Then it was replaced by another organizing principle, which was the principle of property. So everybody should have access to property, right? But once you have property, you should never question property rights. And, you know, in the 19th century, this was very strong. This is like when we abolished uh, slavery, uh, you know, slave owners were compensated for their loss of property. So there was no compensation for slaves, but there was a compensation for slave owners. You know, in particular, France made IT pay, uh, you know, a huge war tribute in effect between 1825 and the 1950s, so during almost one century and a half in order to compensate, you know, slave owners um, uh, for their loss of property. And, you know, liberal thinkers, well, so-called liberal thinkers like Tocqueville, you know, in 1848, uh, uh, was a very strong uh, supporter of compensation to slave owners. You know, he didn't want to hear about doing something for slaves uh, because he said, uh, uh, you know, if you start questioning property rights, including the property right of slave owners, where are you going to stop? Because, you know, what are you going to do with the slave owners who sold this slave five years ago and who now owns a building in Paris or castles in Bordeaux or a, a financial portfolio in Paris? You're also going to go after him. And indeed, you know, probably a fair abolition of slavery, you know, should have involved a compensation to slaves. Actually, some people at the time, like Condorcet at the time of the French Revolution, was not like Tocqueville. He was in favor of compensation to slaves. And, and, but then you need to have some democratic deliberation and some democratic decision making about where you are going to stop in terms of redistribution of wealth. And indeed, this is a complicated process. And, and this was a complicated process back then. It is still a complicated process today. But I think we have no other choice than to, to trust democratic deliberation, democratic decision making to arrive at some acceptable compromise about you know the right distribution of, of of income and wealth but i guess you know one sort of 
perpetual and, and classic argument by the elite, and you know also by you know some you know people you know who are trying to listen the different arguments around, is to say, uh, okay, that's all good and fine, but you know where is this going to stop? Isn't there a risk that this ends up in complete chaos and? And look, it is a complicated, uh, you know, discussion. In, in the end, my my own view is that if you look at history and in particular the experience during the 20th century with a very progressive taxation of income, for instance, in the United States, you know, I, I think it was a big success, and I think that's one reason to believe that you know we can we can do it again in a more ambitious scale involving not only income redistribution, but also redistribution of wealth, uh, involving, you know, a sort of more international perspective, a more global perspective on these issues. Uh, so, you know, I, that's that's the basis of my optimism, is to look at, you know, these successes in history. Now, is this simple, you know, is this simple to convince everyone of that? You know, no, it, it's not simple. It will never be simple. And... Uh, so you're right, you know, in the long run, you know, even the elite, you know, should realize that their own uh, prosperity uh, will not continue for very long with, without a different uh, distribution of wealth. But, yeah, you, you know, th these things are never solved with unanimity. You know, at some point, this is a balance of power. But what I want to stress is that the balance of power, you know, is, is primarily uh, intellectual, institutional, and, and not simply, you know, just, uh, you know, a pure, pure balance of, of power. It's, it's very important to think and think again about the set of institutions, the, the economic platform uh, that, that we want to put in place. And, and, and so, you know, that's you know, what I'm, I'm trying to, to contribute to. You, uh, you mentioned in one of the interviews something. Well, let me I'll broaden out for a second. I see lots of work that, like my kindred spirits growing up in Detroit, are resentful of globalization. Some are resentful of automation and machine learning because the school systems haven't built the rungs and the ladder to allow people to transform from physical work to mental work adequately in many of these places. But I also see another side of this, and Branko Milanovic has been very illuminating in his work with Arjun Jayadev and INET. The narrowing of income and wealth inequality between the global north and the global south, particularly within China, has been quite extraordinary. So there are what you might call uh, as somebody once said to me, it's not clear that God was born in Pittsburgh or Detroit, meaning there are things to cheer for here. And the other dimension, which I find to be very, very tricky, and you brought this up and, and you talked about uh, cultural diversity in among the Brahmin elite, a lot of the people, what I'll call working class, particularly white people that I know in Michigan, say the Brahmin elite are the marketing men for this new globalized system of power and Wall Street and Silicon Valley. And what they do is they understand that there's 400 years of woundedness of people of color, that something like reparations is deserved. But by appointing a handful of them to be in the 1% isn't changing the system. In other words, they didn't appoint Martin Luther King to come and upend mil militarism, racism, and materialism. That they view it as a cynical decoration on the part of the Brahmin elite. And it doesn't send people in the direction of the merchant class. It sends them in the direction I think you called uh, nativism. And, and, and it becomes polarized and very ugly because these people feel like those symbols of transformation, which are deserved, are leaving them out. And that deepens their despair. And so I, I, I see so many of these things um, are, are quite, what I'll call supple, quite complex. And at some level, you're talking about, I think, democracies where what you got to be is called a human being. Regardless, you got to be treated equally as though you have birthrights, not 
rights based on one piece or another or a degree or education or the color of your skin and all that. But I, it's especially with the history of woundedness, it's a very, very tricky uh, road to navigate when we're in such a tumultuous time. No, it, it is tricky, and, and I think it's also, to some extent, it's also the price to pay for some of the collective success. So, you know, I think we, we again, you know, I, I, like you said, you know, there's in recent decades, you know, if you look at the post-1980 evolution of the global structure of inequality, you know, there's been some negative evolution, but there's also been some positive evolution at the, yeah. you know, at international dimension. You know, I think I am large poor countries, if, if you, you know, have made progress, although not all of them, you know, I think it depends also on the possibility to construct, uh, you know, uh, to go into a process of state building and construction of state legitimacy, which, uh, you know, is, is a much more complicated process than just, uh, you know, generalizing free trade, generalizing market competition. You know, if you don't go through this complex process of state building uh, in the different countries, you know, you cannot benefit from market integration. You cannot benefit from 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 anything. So you know, depending on the country we look at, you know, China, India, Sub-Saharan Africa, we get very different outcome of globalization. You know, depending on, on you know whether the, this process of state building, uh, uh, you know, how it how it how it developed in in different manners, uh, and. Oh, in the post-1980 period, there's also been some very positive evolution in terms of gender inequality, which is much less extreme than what it used to be, although it is still enormous. Mm -hmm. and, and in terms of racial uh, inequality, you know, the, the thing is that we started from a situation in the, in the 60s or 70s, which was a, a situation of extreme racial inequality and, and a situation, in fact, where in many cases, people with different from different races or from different you know ethnic or religious origin did not even meet so if you know they were they met through a, a, a complete uh, you know domination uh, through you know in the context of colonial empires uh, through basically military relations but there was so, so very very little direct contact we now live in societies in many parts of the world where people with different uh, origin and you know uh, grandparents or ancestors coming from completely different parts of the world now live in a single political community with, in principle, equality of political rights, although this equality of political rights you know, can be qualified and it's still, uh, we're still far from a, a really meaningful uh, equality of political voice and ability to influence the process. But, you know, at least in terms of formal rights, they live together uh, under a principle of equality of rights. Which, you know, as compared to the situation in the, uh, you know, a few decades ago, is an enormous progress. Now, it, it, it still, it creates frustration, you know, it has created frustration in particular, uh, you know, among people uh, who felt that, you know, their situation has deteriorated or did not improve as much as the rest of the population and they feel they have been abandoned, you know, for the sake of, of making progress for other group of people. So, you know, the only solution is uh, more equality, more democracy, more redistribution in all dimensions. Uh, you know, so, I, you know, I think the only way to make, uh, you know, some of the, of the uh, people who are today uh, feel close to the kind of nativist ideology I was describing and, you know, uh, white poor voters in, in the US or in Europe, is to you know the only way to, to sort of bring them back to the to the political process and to the uh, you know constructive political agenda is to propose uh, you know much more ambitious uh, 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 program of redistribution of income wealth uh, educational expenditures health expenditure you know which which has been proposed so far and and you know I think in the end it's uh, in many cases you know the feeling of being uh, completely abandoned and, and left behind, which has created this uh, resentment. The good news, so to speak, is that the, uh, you know, if you look at the lower uh, income uh, uh, voters, uh, both in, in the US or in Europe, they, they actually have very low rate of political participation, I mean, which is not good in itself, but which shows that, you know, there is a demand, I think, for, for something different. You know, if, 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 if these voters were very happy 
with the sort of nativist uh, political parties or the xenophobic uh, platforms, you know, you will see, uh, you know, 90% participation rate uh, uh, and, and, and which, you know, in, in, in Europe in particular, in the period 1950 to 1980, the participation rate for, for lower income groups was very high, you know, 80%, just like for upper income groups. They were voting for Labour Party in Britain, Social Democratic Party, in some cases, a combination of Socialist Communist Party. They were, they were voting. If you look at the post-1980, post-1990 period, all the decline in participation rate you know, has come from, from lower income groups, probably because you know, they, they felt that the, the, the political uh, choices that were offered to them uh, were not very uh, were not very convincing, including you know the sort of xenophobic uh, platforms that they have been offered, which you know some of them go for it because that's the only option they feel they have. But at the end of the day, most are, are, are just stay at home, are not satisfied with with either platform. So if we if we you know the only possibility in the longer run is to is to change this. This, this will take. A very long time because this is itself a process mm -hmm. that spans mm -hmm. over several decades. But you know, there's no other solution in the long run. So when I hear, you know, uh, sometimes Democratic Party leaders in the U.S. or you know similar political leaders in Europe saying, you know, there's no way we can bring them back. You know, we've done everything we could. Uh, they just don't understand. You know, final point. Look, if you say that, you know, how can you then convince uh, other people or other parts of the world that you believe in electoral democracy? You know, it's it's uh, it's uh, you, you have to be optimistic. Uh, you know, otherwise you cannot even defend. You know, the, the sort of very basis of uh, of uh, mm -hmm. electoral uh, institution, which uh, which uh, you know uh, we, we we are supporting collectively. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, just um, one last question. question. Often people in Asia talk about who is going to lead the world in the next phase, 21st century Asia, China, U.S., vying for leadership. And many people point to the United States, like Kishore Mababani, and say, is it a plutocracy or a democracy? Why are there so many people in prison and so forth? But I recently read in the South China Morning Post a story about when your book, I think it was Capital and Ideology, was planned to be released in China, they don't want to show your research or data on how concentrated the distribution of income and wealth is there. So all these people that come out of the Marxian or Veblen or whatever schools of thought are now in countries, and I would add Russia to that, where the concerns you have about concentration of income and wealth may be as or more severe there than it is in the democratic West. Yeah, definitely. So, yes, yeah, they wanted to cut, you know, every part about China, basically. So, I mean, this was ridiculous. You know, I received this incredible letter from the publisher in China saying, okay, you know, this is the list of, you know, like 30 or 40 pages, basically every page where I was talking about China. So, you know, the nice thing is that, okay, I told them, no way, you know, you will just not publish my book. And in the end, you know, there were a couple of articles in the, in the international press. And in the end, they came back to me. They came back to my French publisher, Le Seuil, and they said, okay, we are not going to cut anything. So, of course, we were very suspicious about their change in mind. And so we said, hold on, we are going to have a very well-written contract where, you know, we... we want to be able to check the translation. So, you know, we hired people who will check the translation here in Paris. And we're still in the process, in fact. It's not yet published. And we'll see, you know, if there is a problem, we will we will say no. Uh, uh, anyway, you know, I, I was, that was an interesting experience. What, what you know, I think the, the, the if the West, uh, you know, want to uh, resist, uh, you know, the, the, the rise of China and, you know, the rise of, you know, <laughs> Democratic countries uh, in general, in particular China and, and Russia, I think they, they also, you know, Western countries also have to put forward, uh, you know, a more ambitious uh, uh, egalitarian uh, development model and, and economic system than what they have been doing so far. And, you know, if, if Western countries simply say, okay, we are the rule of law, we are the rule of justice, we are the rule of democracy, and you should agree with us about everything because we are so much more advanced than you are, 
you know, that's not going to work uh, uh, first because it's not very nice to hear from the rest of the world. And, and next, because this is not true. You know, we, there are some institutions that were developed uh, in Western countries that, that are working better than other institutions. But, you know, there are also so many... Uh, you know, so many problems with the functioning of our democracy, you know, the funding of political campaign is incredibly uh, unequal, uh, access to education is incredibly unequal, the international tax system, and of course the domestic tax system, but particularly the international tax system is is uh, is, is uh, not equitable. So, you know, if, if Western countries don't come with, with proposals, concrete proposals to change this, you know, how are they going to be able to tell, you know, people in India or people in Brazil who today, you know, are happy to get, uh, you know, cheap uh, oil from uh, from Russia or happy to get, uh, you know, investment uh, subsidies from uh, from uh, China? And and you know, if you if you you continue with an economic system where we sort of keep the, the wealth for us, we 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 don't want to share at all, you know, any of the new resources that we get from. Uh, from uh, tax events, you know, how, how can we convince, you know, these countries, you know, who are very poor, you know, as compared to Western countries, uh, that, you know, they should not take this uh, cheap oil from Russia, etc. So all the discussion about, you know, the, the, the rule of law, the rule of democracy, and of course, you know, the, 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 the you know the, the fact that we need to to resist to the to the military escalation by by Russia and you know possible uh, uh, new uh, military escalation by China you know after the the, the uh, you know terrible crash on democracy in Hong Kong which happened in the past two three years and you know what, what would be the next step in Taiwan but you know if we want to be credible on these issues I think we have at the same time you know to propose. To uh, uh, the south and to poor countries, you know, much better deal, and in a way which is a much more respectful of state building, state legitimacy. So, so typically, we need uh, you know automatic rights to get a certain fraction of certain tax resources in the past, rather than forcing you know countries to beg year after year for for aid, which uh, typically uh, 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 never comes. You know, remember some of the commitments that were made at the end of 2015 at the Paris Summit on, on Global uh, Climate Change, uh, you know, are still not paid. So Western countries had, uh, during the conference, you know, committed to uh, uh, actually two small uh, commitments to, to uh, finance uh, uh, adaptation fund and, and the mitigation fund uh, that the, the countries in the south could use in order to limit the consequences of global warming but you know the payments that were announced by, by rich countries at the time you know have still not been made uh, in, in full so you know the credibility of uh, you know of, of these countries is, uh, is uh, severely damaged by this so i you know if we if we want to to you know to be convincing uh, uh, and and to confront you know the alternative uh, model you know starting with china uh, th this will uh, this will have to change okay so let's uh, thank you let's turn to the questions uh, i have one quick one and then a couple that i'd pair together the first one is what is your view thomas of universal basic income and its potential role in creating income security in a world of growing economic insecurity in its ability to reduce inequality and create a floor of economic rights as part of a citizen's rights? So, you know, I, I, uh, I like the form of, of uh, universal basic income or let, let's call it a minimum income scheme that, that in fact we already have in a large number of European countries. It's not sufficiently automatic, but it's targeted on, on individuals who have uh, a labor income below a certain level. And I think it's uh, it's uh, it could be improved, it could be made automatic, but I think basically this is the right uh, approach because once you pass a certain income level, I think we should still have the ideal of uh, wage earner status with uh, wage stability and labor rights uh, uh, for workers in corporations, you know, I am very much in favor of having more uh, uh, voting rights for worker representatives in board of companies where they can negotiate, you know, better salary scale, better wages. And I am concerned that, you know, by giving basic income 
to absolutely everyone, even you know, if people have a job, even if people have an income above a certain level, in, you know, this could be a way to to then uh, you know actually deregulate the, the the labor market and and sort of deconstruct the, the wage uh, wage earner status. So I think you know minimum income is absolutely a central institution. Uh, that's for sure. But you know, in any case, let, let me say this. You know, it will always it will never be very large. So you know, I am in favor of it. But you know, basic income. You know, depending on the proposal. It's going to be, you know, anywhere between 50% or uh, 75% of a full-time uh, minimum wage. You know, that's never... Uh, okay, that's good. It's important to have it, you know, so that nobody falls below this level. But, you know, that's not going to be the magic bullet. So I think it has to come together with a very ambitious uh, uh, welfare state program, access to education, access of, uh, on health in a much more egalitarian way than what we have today. It could come with other uh, systems like, uh, you know, the, the, the job guarantee uh, uh, proposal that was, uh, that was pushed, uh, you know, by a number of people, including uh, Pavlina Chernieva recently, where, you know, you can have uh, access to a full-time minimum wage uh, uh, job uh, that is uh, that is administered by you know local uh, bodies and municipalities and various uh, non-profit uh, organization and this has to come also in my view in the long run with a minimum inheritance for all you know through redistribution of wealth because which is you know even more ambitious because you know in addition to the minimum income which will be you know maybe uh, uh, 50% or 75% of full-time minimum wage and job guarantee at the level of minimum wage. If you have, in addition to that, uh, you know, minimum inheritance to all where, you know, I proposed everybody would have, say, you know, 120,000 uh, euros or 150,000 dollars, you know, around 60% of average wealth per adult at age 25. Uh, uh, the, you know, this, this will make a big difference because, you know, people who have millions or billions maybe don't make the difference between having zero or having 100 or 200,000 euros. But in fact, you know, it makes a huge difference. You know, remember, you know, the bottom 50% of the population in the US, you know, owns less than 1% of total wealth. They, they own basically nothing at all. In Europe, it will be 3 to 4%. Okay, that's better than 1 or 2% in the US, but it's ridiculously small. When you don't own anything or when you only have debt, negative wealth, you know, you are in a very weak uh, bargaining position, you know, vis-a-vis -vis your own life, vis-a-vis -vis society in general, because this means, you know, you have to accept anything, you have to take any working condition, any jobs that you are being proposed anyways, because, you know, you need to pay for your rent, you need to pay for your family, you cannot... You know, you get, whereas if you have 100, 200, in, you know, in addition to the basic income, to the job guarantee system, then, you know, you can start to negotiate. You can start saying no to certain offers. You can start your own business. You can start projects, you know, which you will not dare starting otherwise. You can buy a, a little home so that, you know, you don't need to pay your rent every month. You know, this makes a more dynamic society, a more decentralized society where more people could uh, have uh, access to more opportunities and more, uh, more, more, uh, more bargaining power. So this is just to say, okay, basic income is important, but you know, it, it will always be relatively small in terms of amount uh, as compared to average income, average wealth in society. So this will never be the magic bullet. That's important. We need to do it, but this has to come with a whole series of more ambitious uh, uh, reforms. You know, to me, this is really mm -hmm. sort of ground zero of uh, of social uh, social uh, social reform and and wealth redistribution. Thank you. I've got kind of, I'll, I'll read you three questions, but they all resonate with the same theme. Okay, the Rob, there's something there's something, Rob, I need to tell you, which is that I have a young age uh, uh, children at home, yeah. which with a babysitter, which okay. I, I'm going to have to to. To, to go there quite quite soon. I'm really sorry. In fact, I should go there right away. So, I, I mean, I can answer another question if you want, but okay. then I will. This will be the last question, and I, uh, I want to applaud your treatment of the future generations, not just the present. Uh, I have two young children as well, and I appreciate your, your discipline and your focus on them. Let, so quickly, 
In a time when elites are becoming more powerful, not only economically, but politically, do you think it's possible to change the institutions that produce inequality? What incentive do they have? And then the second one is you talked about how money in politics is a corrupting factor. Could you give us a comparative view across different countries? And finally, a, a, a question about the United States. While your data tells a story of long run progress towards equality, the period from 1980 to the present has seen a retracement in America. Given the difficulty of near impossibility of amending the US Constitution, where do you see hope? Look, it's true that sometimes, you know, when I look at the US and in particular the, the, the fact that, you know, money has taken so much control of the political process and, and you know, the situation in many ways is so entrenched and, you know, you have so mm -hmm. many uh, congressmen, you know, so-called uh, centrist uh, congressmen in Washington uh, from the Democratic Party or from the Republican, but including from the Democratic Party, who are so... Uh, you know, so financed in a way by, by you know, big money that they, they don't, uh, you know, they, they, their economic views, uh, their fiscal views, you know, are so conservative. So sometimes, you know, I feel uh, like everyone, you know, I feel I, I feel that, you know, that's not going to be easy to change. So, you know, I'm, I'm sometimes, you know, I tend to be more optimistic for Europe or other parts of the world sometimes than, than for the US. But, you know, at the same time, I should say, you know, we are always surprised by, by, you know, electoral mobilization, political process in history. So what, something I want to remember is that, you know, in the, in the United States, uh, you know, I remember, you know, 10 years ago, or a bit less than 10 years ago, in 2000, back in 2014, you know, I, after the publication of Capital in the 21st Century, I was having a public uh, debate with Elizabeth Warren in Boston. And I remember at the time I was pushing for the progressive wealth tax with tax rate up to five, up to 10, 5 to 10 percent per year for a billionaire. And I remember Elizabeth Warren telling me, oh, you know, this is this is too big. How can you think about something like that? And, and then, you know, uh, eight years, uh, or actually, no, six years later, you know, in 2020, uh, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders were competing about who was going to propose the biggest wealth tax with a wealth tax rate of up to 5 to 10 percent per year. And so, you know, think, and, and most importantly, you know, there was majority approval. If you look at opinion polls, you know, not only among Democrats, but also among Republicans about the idea of a billionaire tax. And, you know, we should remember that, the, uh, you know, every country has a, has a complicated and ambitious relation with equality, including, of course, the United States, which invented very progressive taxation at the beginning of the 20th century. And I think even today, you know, a large fraction of the population uh, uh, feels that, you know, this is necessary to renew with this kind of policy. And also, you know, uh, let's remember that, you know, uh, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, you know, got uh, almost half of the vote and actually much more than half of the vote if you look at voters in the primary below 40 uh, in age. So, you know, it's uh, things, you know, with a different candidate, with a different, uh, you know, maybe someone younger, maybe someone, you know, I don't know, with more diverse origin, I don't know, you know, this could, uh, you know, things could change, could change. So, you know, I, 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 I am not impressed, you know, by people who sort of know in advance, uh, you know, what's going to happen or what's not going to happen. And, and you know, we have to, I guess, you know, the best way to contribute uh, wherever we are about this process, you know, I think is to contribute to this democratization of, you know, economic knowledge and economic conversations that I was talking about at the, at the, at the beginning, which to me, is really a key condition for for uh, you know transformation of power relation uh, uh, in 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 general and then you know whatever will happen will happen and you know we cannot predict everything but we have to be ready to contribute to this uh, to this collective uh, process and to this uh, uh, process of uh, of democratic change and deliberation okay so we should close here i always use some kind of artistic or music parable that comes to my mind as I'm listening to you talk. And I've often thought today of a song called Woman of Heart and Mind by Joni Mitchell, because I think you are an economist of heart and mind. But the one that really comes through to me is by a man named Todd Brunkgren. It's called I Saw the Light. I saw the light. Excuse me. It was late last night. I was feeling something wasn't right. There was not another soul in sight. 
only you. So we walked along, though I knew there was something wrong about, and a feeling hit me very strong about you. Then you gazed up at me, and the answer was plain to see, because I saw the light in your eyes. I think that you should tell your children as we get off that my children are going to hear about this discussion on the day when you win the Nobel Prize in economics. Because I'm proud to have met you. You are shining a light on where we have to go. You are our navigator in this profession. You are a leader almost without compare other than your other members of your inner circle. And I want to thank you for being here today, but more importantly, for what you're doing for your children, my children, and everybody with the courage that you demonstrate.